But look over at Luke 15, and I, I want us to, to, this is the word that, you remember last week, um, was it last week that was Father's Day? Yeah. You remember that we had a lot to do. I, I wanted to read you the, the Father's Blessing, remember we did that, and I also had, was it 56 slides uh, that, that we ran through real quick. Uh, that was just the Lord talking back to us. Remember, we threw yeah. up all kinds of things. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. All of those things. We, we had a good time. But but you remember in that word I shared, I had another piece that I didn't think we would get to. And so yeah. this is that piece. Uh, because I believe that sonship uh, and fatherhood uh, are all about commitment. And I would even go so far as to say covenant in general mm -hmm. uh, is no better than the commitment behind it. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of married couples that are wearing um, wedding bands mm -hmm. on their hands, but just because you have a wedding band mm -hmm. on doesn't mean you're committed. Amen. That's right. right. That's right. right? So true. And, and so, <clears throat> it, likewise... Um, there, there's something to commitment. There's something to obedience. And it keeps us, and even from time to time, we renew it. Yes. Have, have you ever, in your marriage, yes. have you ever renewed your vow? Yes. Well, we renew our vows. We renew our commitment. Yes. We renew our covenant uh, with the Lord yes. along our journey. Yes. And some people would call that a personal revival, and others would call it something else. But really it's about uh, coming back into awareness of God and His calling and His purpose for your life and giving Him more of your heart and, and re-establishing a connection that maybe has been lost. Yes. And so I want to talk about renewing commitment. And I thought of Luke chapter 15. This is the the portion of Scripture that uh, has to do with the prodigal son. And so, let me read this to you and then talk about it, but I want to not spend so much time here because even this morning the Lord's given me some new new thoughts and new things that, that I want to talk about. But anyway, beginning in verse 11. Are you there, Luke 15? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and He said... A, this is Jesus. A certain man had two sons. Now Jesus is telling this story. And he says, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Unto, he divided unto them. Meaning he divided the gifts. He divided all the gifts, all the inheritance. He divided it uh, for his living. There's some great word studies here that I won't, I won't take so much time. But by the way, it says there in verse 11, a certain man had two sons. That word there is number 5207, and it's weos. So what that means is they were of age for maturity. They were, yeah. they they weren't just children playing ball in the yard. Amen. Amen. They had grown up and mm -hmm. they were ready for some responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so the younger one said, "I want, I want my inheritance now." Mm -hmm. And not many, verse thirteen. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together. That's a that's a great study there, number forty eight sixty three. If you want to study that word but it's an intentional and a very careful gathering together. So he got what he was going to get, and he was gathering it all up. And he took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance, substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk 
that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And verse 17, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And when he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion <coughs> and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let's eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. We don't use that word much, but they threw a huge party. Now his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house, and he heard all the music and the dancing. And he called one of the servants, and he asked, What do these things mean? And he said to him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry. Really. He was angry. And would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. Mm -hmm. And he answering said to his father, Lo, many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time your commandment. And yet, you never gave me a fatty calf, a kid, and I might make that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son, interesting, was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed a fatty calf for him. And he said to him, Son, thou art ever with me. And all that I have is yours. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. It's interesting that the, the son, the second son, the proud son we'll call him, the one who didn't leave and squander but stayed, it's interesting that uh, he doesn't call his brother, brother in this story. Now the Holy Spirit is the one that told the story. All Scripture is God breathed, right? And so every word is intentional. It's not just, it's not just a mistake that it appears this way. So, so he doesn't call uh, his other brother, the prodigal, he doesn't call him brother, he calls him thy son. Can you see an accusation in that? He don't belong to me. He's yours. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And interesting that when the father speaks, he reminds the second son that he's your brother. Oh, Amen. Right. He's your brother. Mm -hmm. He's your brother. No, in essence he's saying, no, he's your son. Not my brother. So it's interesting um, what must be going on in the heart. Right? How many of you know Proverbs 4? Is it 23? Guard thy heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of life. The quality of life, the kind of life that I have is a product of my own heart. Yes, it is. And so it is with the prodigal. And so it is with the proud son. And so it, it's, it's, I love this story. It's interesting. It's so filled with, with word studies and, and deep meaning. So first let me ask you, how many sons are in the story? The answer's four. 
See, I gave the answer for it. You said something. <laughs> I'm on your side. I'm helping you. There's four. There's four. There's the prodigal son. And of course, there's the, what I would call the proud son. There is the father who is a, a progenitor. And he is also a son. Right? And then there's Jesus telling the story. And I would call him the perfect son. Amen. So you got the prodigal son, the proud son, the progenerate son, and what? The perfect, the perfect son. Four, Amen. four sons in the story. So let's look at the first one here, real quickly. What's what is going on with the prodigal? Well, he wants his independence. Mm -hmm. He want that's he yeah. he wants his independence. Notice in verse 13, and many days after he, uh, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey. Most always, whenever there is a physical separation in relationships, the separation started on the inside. Yes. Amen. That there was a disconnect. There was something that happened on the inside that that dishonored one or both of the parties in the relationship, but there's something... The disconnect happens on the inside before yes, you does. see it on the outside. Mm -hmm. When you see it on the outside, it shocks us sometimes. Oh my goodness. Well, that's been going on a while. Yes, because it has. Because yes, it happens in the heart before it happens yes, outside. Yes, it does. And it happened... Mm -hmm. right. See, in verse 12, the prodigal said what, what I read you, but... But it is the equivalent of saying, going to a father and saying, I want my inheritance and I want it now. That would be the equivalent of saying, I wish you were dead. Mm -hmm. I, I wish you'd hurry up and die mm -hmm. so I could have my inheritance. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't say that, but he asked for the inheritance. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, it, it was so dishonoring to the father what's going on here this father that Jesus is telling us about. It, so so uh, heartbreaking for him. But he, the inward separation comes before the outward separation happens. It says not many days after. The physical happened not many days after. Interesting. And so then he went on and he squandered his inheritance. Now look at verse uh, 16. In verse 16 he says... It, it, King James uses a word here we would never use. Uh, and he would fain have filled his belly uh, with the husk that the swine did eat. Uh, what would fain means is, is the word is epithumio. And it means to desire or long after with affections. Now can you imagine being in a hog pen watching those hogs eat what you fed them? And you sitting back and lusting after, longing for, having affectionate thoughts about having what those swine are eating. You're that hungry. You're that destitute. So that's the condition. So he had a nice inheritance, but he squandered his substance, the Scripture says, and he would faint. He would have given anything to be eaten the diet of the hogs. And then he comes to verse 16. And when he came to himself. Do you remember when you came to yourself? Do you remember someone you've been ministering to, ministering to, ministering to through the years and they finally came to themselves. Yeah. Amen. Do you remember that? Do you remember Amen. praying for people and Amen. all of a sudden they turn around yeah. and it was like a veil was lifted and it was clear again. They could think again and 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 come to themselves. Well the word is E R C H O M A I Erkomai. And it means recover one's senses. Mm or recover one's understanding. Mm -hmm. And so he is down in the hog pen with the hogs. Used to be at the king's table, the mm -hmm. father's table, but now he's in the hog pen. And all that his dad gave him early, 
is squandered. And he starts lusting after even what the hogs are eating. Wow. And no man will give to it. Interesting. And so he starts lusting for what they ate. And then he came to himself and says, here's what I'm going to do. You know, my hired, the hired servants of my dad, they've got bread to spare. They're living a whole lot better than I'm living. I'm going back to him and tell him I've sinned against heaven and against him. And I'm not no longer worthy to be called his son, but I would go back to work as even a hired servant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, how many of you know the Father's heart never is going to let that happen? Yeah. That's right. Can I say that? This felt so good. Can I say that one more time? The Father's heart never is going to let that happen. That's true never is going to make a servant out of a son. That's right. He makes sons out of servants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in verse 17, the prodigal son, he began to see things that were true. Have you ever seen things, but they were not true? Mm -hmm. And then you started seeing things, oh, but wait a minute, this is true. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit, He works with us that way, doesn't He? Yeah. The Spirit of truth, He unveils, He yeah. shows us things, He reveals things. And that's what's happening to Him while He's in the, the uh, pigsty. But first, He admitted to Himself His folly and the results of His folly. Mm -hmm. He had to admit it to Himself first. And our hearts, when we read this story, well, we, we rejoice that He comes to His senses. He admits His sin. And we rejoice about the Father unconditionally loving Him and forgiving Him. Totally forgiving Him for what He's done. And I want to tell you, it, it broke the Father's heart. Um, it, I mean, you know what it would do to a father in our culture. Um, but man, even more in his culture, uh, to have a son do that and uh, forsake his whole birthright um, and sell it for a few parties along the way uh, with harlots, uh, it tore his heart out. Now, so he got, but he's back. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And then you have the proud son. We pick him up. <coughs> Excuse me. In verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house, and he heard music and dancing. Now by the end of this story, the proud son is the only one that doesn't get in on the party. Now imagine, the prodigal comes home expecting to become a hired servant. But he gets surprised by an unconditional, loving, accepting father that forgives it all and brings out the best of everything for him who doesn't deserve it. But then here comes the proud son. And he walks in and wants to know what's going on. He's the one that stayed outside of the party. He did the right things, but he did them for the wrong reason. He stayed home. The prodigal left and went out and squandered. But the proud son stayed home. Well, if you just look at that, you'd say, well, he's the good son. And that's the bad son out there. That's the black sheep of the family. You know, he's the one out there going wild. But you've got this good son that stayed at home. Well, he was physically at home. But in his heart he was at home. And so he did the right things for the wrong reasons. So whereas the prodigal son, what was his problem? He wanted independence and he was controlled by self-indulgence. The second son, the proud son, well, he is self-centered and proud. Self-centered and proud. He has wrapped himself up in self-centeredness. And so it's all about him. It's all about him. 
And you know, have you ever been in a relationship where it seems like when you come together, it's all about them? It's all about them. And you try to get in, well, let me tell you what's going on with us. And, and pretty soon you're right back, oh, what's going on with them? Right? It, it is a self centeredness about uh, pride has a self centeredness mm -hmm. attached to it. And so, three things here. Number one, he revealed his self righteousness. Number two, he excuses his own bitterness. And number three, he expects his reward too. So the prodigal, he's upset with the prodigal because the prodigal got his inheritance, asked for it early, and went and squandered it. But the son's doing the very same thing, wanting his inheritance because he's never got what the prodigal had received. Interesting. So three things. He revealed his self-righteousness. Number two, he excuses his bitterness. And number three, he expects uh, his reward. But here's the deal. Remember I said that he, they both, the two sons, were weos. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're in the sandbox in the yard playing. That means they're taking on responsibility. They're able to run daddy's business. They're of the age of maturity. They're of the age of, of accountability. They, they need to be doing something. They're of that age mm -hmm. to take on responsibility. Um, but looking at himself only, looking at himself only, he's never going to lead anybody. You can't be a leader of people if you're self-centered and you look at yourself only. If you consider your own self in all your thoughts and all your plans and all your matters, you're not going to lead anybody. And so here's this proud son, and he's not developing either. He didn't take the path that the prodigal took, but yet he still took a path. Uh, and it wasn't going to lead him to, to God's best. So here's a quote. I can't remember where I got it from. I'd have to go search and search and search so I give nobody credit for this. Uh, so I'll take credit for it. No, I'll tease it. People who live for themselves are in a mighty small business. Mm -hmm. yeah. People who live for themselves. The proud son, he's living for himself. And another great thought, uh, I think this one did come from me, I believe. The Lord can do great things through those who don't care who gets the credit. Mm -hmm. And you remember in um, 1 Peter 5.5, 5, God resists mm -hmm. the, proud. the proud. He gives grace to the humble. So can you see that verse working in this story? The prodigal is self-indulgent and independent. And he wants the goody. He wants the inheritance. But he doesn't want the responsibility that goes with it. He doesn't want the role and the responsibilities that go with being an, a son of inheritance. And so he goes and squanders. But through the process of his circumstances... He is humble. And God gives grace to the humble. Even the humble that have been a jerk. He gives grace to the humility of heart. But He also, with as much strength, He resists the proud. And so can you see that the son at home, he keeps doing, he keeps serving, he keeps serving... But when he sees this squandering brother come back home and get, he squandered your inheritance. Now you're giving him the fatted calf. You never gave me one. It's all his homecoming of his brother is all about him. Yeah. Is all about him. And then there is the progenerating son, um, the father in the story. And. He has fulfilled His command in Genesis to, to be fruitful and multiply. And, and He's doing that. But He is then rejected by His own Son. Now how painful do you reckon that was? 
being rejected by the Son. And, and you know the Father's heart towards Him. It was, it was an abundant heart. And we could even go so far as to say the Father in the story is showing the character of God Himself towards His Son. And so, but then He's rejected. He's rejected by His own Son. And the daily pain of Him having to, to wait for His Son to wake up. But here's the deal. That's not just like you're folding of hands and waiting in, the, in your chair in the living room for your Son to come home. It's not that. He, he, was, he was doing that, waiting for His Son, but knowing all along that while He waited, His Son's life was in jeopardy. Right? I mean, if you're laying face down in a pig pen and you're lusting after corn husk that the hogs are eating, I mean, you're in a dangerous spot. And there's just no telling what you could get connected to, associated with. And who knows what might happen from a destitute situation like that. Uh, so, but he was confronted then with a sense of loss. He had lost his son. Remember he said, my son was dead and is alive again. So this was a big deal to the dad. A, a huge deal. Uh, he had a sense of loss. And also... He had a sense that my son's destiny has been squandered. He went out and squandered it all. All that was to, to build and help him become who God had made him to be, he could have used that and it would have been a huge blessing, but he squandered and threw it away. Now his, his, even his destiny is in jeopardy. Now. But when he saw his son coming, hallelujah, his compassion was moved. And it moved him to an expression. King James says he ran. He fell down on his son's neck and he kissed him. And he started giving him robes and sandals and fatted calves and throwing a great big party for him. Uh, so his compassion is something that we need to say is very real uh, in the Father's heart. The second thing is forgiveness. He forgave his son unconditionally. Uh, so he reveals that he has a abundant heart towards a son who is repentant. He has an abundant heart to his son who has become uh, repentant. And he entreats, he goes out and entreats uh, his proud son and so in the Father's heart, it, it seems to me in the story, he, He's abundantly fair. He's abundantly fair. Uh, the Son, the proud Son, thought that the Father was lavishing all this on the prodigal. And uh, it somehow was at His expense. It wasn't at His expense at all. The Father says, man, you are ever with me. All that I have is yours. Uh, so it's interesting. And I guess the greatest lesson out of, of the Father uh, in the story is love never fails. Amen. I hope you put an asterisk by that note. Love never, never fails. Love never, never fails. Love never fails. Never, yes. never, never fails. Love can go into a pigsty. Yes. Love can reach when nothing else will. Amen. Love can yes. redirect when nothing else will. Love, the heat of love can melt what nothing else can melt. A hardness, a coldness. The love of God can melt. And it, it did it did in this story. And then there's the guy telling the story. Maybe, maybe you've heard of it. His name is Jesus. He's the perfect son. And you know everything he did was right. And so he's the one telling the story. But he, Jesus, was our example of servant leadership. Which is the opposite of this, this guy that stayed in the house. The son that stayed in the house. Jesus is all about servant leadership. And the thing about Jesus is He obeyed His Father completely. He obeyed Him completely. 
uh, even though a cross was between him and obedience, he obeyed it. And you see a difference in the perfect son and the prodigal son. And a difference in the perfect son and the proud son. Well, this is a whole new manner of sonship that Jesus is living here. And so, uh, he, Jesus came not to receive ministry, but to minister to others. Amen. So had Jesus been the son, the second son in the house, and the prodigal had come home, Jesus would have ran with the father right. out Amen. and fell yeah. on his neck and kissed him yeah. and been a part of the party, right? Yeah. But that, that wasn't the, the proud son's response. So from the cradle, Jesus now we're talking about, from the cradle to the towel in his basin where he washed the disciples' feet to the cross, mm -hmm. All the way through his life and ministry, he lived life for others. Mm -hmm. He lived life for others. Mm -hmm. He lived life That's right. That's good. for mm -hmm. others. He Amen. lived life for others. Mm -hmm. So what's the lesson here? Well, in contrast, the prodigal son and his independence and the proud son and his self-centeredness, Jesus forever demonstrates servanthood, true servant. And he focuses on pleasing. Now catch this. He focuses, Jesus focuses on pleasing the Father while, say the word while. Wow. Wow. He pleases the Father while investing lovingly and faithfully in others. Amen. 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 If, if, if I had a room full of pastors and apostles and prophets and leaders, this might be the thing I would want to say. Is you don't work for the people. You work for the Lord. You don't serve the people. You serve the Lord. But because you serve the Lord, you serve His people. Now that may not sound... That may sound like just just words. Mm -hmm. But there's a huge motive change in that statement. Mm -hmm. I serve the Lord. I'm here on the earth to please Him. Amen. So are you yes. on the earth to please That's Him, right. not yeah. please your mama, yes. or your daddy, Amen. or your grandma or granddaddy, right. or your co-workers, That's right. or your friends, Amen. or your extended That's family right. members. You're not here to serve anybody but Jesus. That's right. But because you serve Jesus, right. you lay your life down yes. and wash others' feet. Yes. And you know I'm not talking about just taking a basin of water and going around washing <coughs> feet. I'm talking about with your life, you wash, yeah. uh, you wash people's feet. And so, uh, my goodness, that, that is Jesus, He had it. He pleased the Father first. But He did it not at the cost of the people. He lovingly invested himself in others, but his heart belonged to one. Yes. And that was his father. Amen. And so here is here's a quote from John Maxwell. I, I know who I know who to give credit to this one. Leadership is servanthood. Observance of this truth keeps your motives pure and protects you from ambition. Isn't that good? Yeah. Leadership is servanthood. Mm -hmm. Observance of this truth keeps your motives pure and protects you from ambition. Uh, here's something else I picked up along the way that I, uh, I love quotes. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's one that I picked up somewhere. Kings have always sent their people out to die for them. But King Jesus died for His people. Amen. That's servant leadership. Amen. It's laying down your life for others. Amen. So, now, what, are the di what is the difference between the progenerate Son, the Father, and the perfect Son, Jesus, from these other two guys, the prodigal and the proud Son? And I think it is, if you had to wrap it up all in one statement, it's commitment. The commitment level of the prodigal son wasn't much, was it? 
Uh, the commitment of the proud son wasn't much, was it? But the commitment of the father, think of that. And the commitment of Jesus, think of that. So commitment is a part of my our maturing process. Uh, that that from time to time must be renewed. You must renew your commitment. And I hope to have enough time if I'll if I'll hurry up a little bit, we'll have enough time to talk about an example of this. It's just absolutely a living living color. Uh, but look first at John chapter twelve. John 12 in verse uh, beginning verse 23 and Jesus answered them saying the hour is come that the son of man should be glorified verily verily I say unto you except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abideth alone but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled. Watch this. Now is my soul troubled. Jesus speaking. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Mm. So this whole thing about becoming glorious is not an event. It's a process. Mm. Hallelujah. Isn't that, isn't that something? So I'm reading this verse to remind you of this statement here. You and me, we are the fruit of Jesus' obedience. Yes. Jesus obeyed the Father. He, he made Him one, like I was talking about earlier, but He lived and made choices as if He were one or because He is one. So many times say, yeah, Jesus, Jesus is Lord. I love Jesus. But then you don't do anything He says. And, and Jesus is, didn't live that way. He but he obeyed God with his life. But you and I are free today because of his obedience. Yes. Or I could say it this way, you and I are free today because of his committed obedience. Amen. Now Peter, remember him? Uh, the power of the Holy Spirit is what changed Peter. He was a rascal before the Holy Spirit got him. Now, I don't know if any of you were ever rascals before. Some of you still rascals, <laughs> even, even though you did receive the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit changed his nature, and he changed his commitment. Remember, when Jesus, when they came and got Jesus, Peter wasn't very committed, was he? He sold Jesus under the bus, didn't he? Uh, he wasn't very committed, but later on we see him walking down the streets uh, and his shadow healing people. Well, what in the world happened to him? He was a coward and now he's a healer. Uh, well, the governor in his life changed. The governor in his life changed. And when Jesus Amen. became, Thou art, this came out of Peter's mouth, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now that was a revelation, but it turned into a lifestyle. And man, wouldn't that be something if all of our revelations turned into lifestyle? Praise the Lord. Amen. 
Because <clears throat> knowledge without wisdom is not very good, not very important. And at the best, it'll puff you up. But when you have wisdom to apply the knowledge, and, and that's what happened to Peter. He got filled uh, with the Holy Spirit. His revelation turned in to a, a lifestyle and his inconsistencies and his self-seeking attitudes once he got a new governor in his life. All that changed. And he, well, he's written... His obedience is in this book. And thank God, the revelation that God gave Peter and the things that, that he wrote us uh, is fascinating. Yeah. But it came from a guy who used to be a coward mm -hmm. and self-seeking, looking after number one and mm -hmm. selling anybody under the bus that he needed to do so. Right? Uh, now, whenever we... Whenever we get a new governor, do you remember that you used to be your governor? Yeah. yeah. And then you 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 gave that ownership of that thing, that role, over to the Lord. Yeah. Amen. And he became your governor. Uh, and and that is um, that's what I hear the Holy Spirit saying today is to recommit, recommit you. Recommit you. You are on a journey. Mm -hmm. And time and time and time again along this journey, it's it's very powerful to recommit yes. mm -hmm. and reestablish yes. what journey you're on yes. and for who you're on the journey for. Amen. Yes. And reestablish and recommit and put down flags along the way to establish where it is you say you're going. Mm -hmm. And and that that is is commitment. Now a little bit more on commitment before we change gears here. Look at Psalm thirty seven. I want to show you something interesting. I knew some of this already, um, but I saw I saw a little more into the window of commitment uh, that I, I want to share with you here. But Psalm 37, this is one of my favorites. Um, I mention it all the time. But beginning in verse 3, notice these powerful words. Trust in the Lord and do good. Shall thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Here's another powerful word. Number 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord and He shall give you the desires of your heart. You will know that word delight. We've studied it many times through the years. You've probably got stuff scribbled down in your Bible around it. But it means to lay yourself open. This is an intimate term where a husband and wife would do this kind of thing. Uh, they would lay themselves open to each other, be vulnerable and intimate with each other. That's the nature of the word. And so when it says delight yourself in the Lord. Lay yourself bare and open to the Lord. Don't hide. Amen. Don't be hard. Make it easy for the Lord to show you anything about your heart and anything He wants to do with you. He's the Lord for goodness sake. I don't have to measure how much room I give Him because He never disappoints and He never takes advantage. He never abuse me for any purpose. I can trust Him. I don't need to turn the light on and see what He's doing. Right? He's already, he's already the light. He's already the light. So now watch then. Now the fifth, the number five, the next strong word. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him and He shall bring it to pass. Bring what to pass? Those desires that He put in your heart because you were delighting yourself in Him. He filled your heart with His own wishes and intentions for your life. And when you commit that way into the Lord, what happens? And trust Him. He shall bring it to pass. Amen. He shall bring it to pass. Mm. Now the word commit here is is a fascinating word and I've taught this a number of times mainly on Easter 
in times like that. If we talk about rolling the stone away on Golgotha, uh, <clears throat> on the, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus was placed there. Three days later, an angel rolled the stone away. And, and so that's where we that's what we call Golgotha. But the word here commit is the word Galhal. And it's where we get Golgotha from. And so always when you're talking about commitment, there is a sense that you need to always keep in the, in that commitment idea that there is a rolling away. Mm-hmm. A rolling from and a rolling to. Um, man, that that's good. Uh, the word, if you if you want to study it later, is number fifteen fifty six. Um, fascinating word. Uh, let me read you Zodiates. Um, you know many of you have one of his study Bibles. Let me read you a note he puts here that I think is is fascinating on this word, uh, galal. It means to, to whirl or to roll, to turn, to drive away, to be rolled together, to roll oneself upon. Now watch. To be rolled in blood, to be dyed red. And so, that's commitment, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You, you're going you're gonna to dye yourself and your clothing, and you commit your whole self to it, and you roll in blood. That is commitment. It's the idea of rolling. It always has commitment, always has the idea of, of rolling. Uh, driving something away, or rolling to a new day, a new season, but it, it's always commitment, always has to do this idea of rolling. It's the picture of rolling oneself upon the Lord, therefore trusting. It's committing one's life to the Lord or removing contempt. And this also uh, points out that uh, in Second Samuel 20 and 12, um, Amasa, he wallowed in his own blood. Same, same word, same thought. Um, and then, let me show you just one. In Joshua 5, look at this one. Joshua chapter 5, verse 9, is, is another place. But here, um, after I saw this in the middle of the night, I wondered, because of a note I had written there, I wondered, had I seen this before? But I... It, it came, you know how when God shows you something, it just comes rolling in like it's new and you've never heard it before. It has that sense. Well, this is what happened to me here. Uh, in Joshua chapter 5, And the Lord said, well, let's go back to... Uh, let's go to verse 7. And their children whom they raised in their stead, them Joshua circumcised. And they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised. Uh, they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were made whole. Now watch what happens after their obedient. How I many of you know in the old covenant? It was obedience to be circumcised. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How many of you know that in the New Covenant, we too, it's obedience yeah. to be circumcised. Yeah. It's just our heart that yeah. is circumcised. Yeah. Right? Amen. Right? Mm-hmm. All right. And so it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places until they all got told. And the Lord said to Joshua this day, interesting, this day after your commitment, Mm-hmm. or after your renewed commitment mm-hmm. this day your commitment your renewed commitment marks this day mm-hmm. this day have I number 1556 mm-hmm. I have rolled away wow. the reproach 
Amen. of Egypt from off you. Amen. Can you say from off me? Off from off me. me. Have you got anything you need from off me? Yeah. And so this day I've rolled away the reproach from off you. Wherefore the name of this place is called Gilgal. To this day it's still called Gilgal. Notice that the place is named because of what happened. There. That's right. And notice what happened there. The reason that Gilgal became this day called Gilgal mm -hmm. is because of a renewed commitment right. that they were making unto the Lord. Amen. And so what happened? They got freedom. Mm -hmm. Now watch this, watch this progression. They got freedom. <coughs> Why did they get freedom? Because they renewed their commitment. Why did they renew That's their commitment? Good. Amen. Because they obeyed. They made choices of obedience. Wow. So according to my choices mm -hmm. of obedience, I can renew commitment to the Lord. Yes. Yes. And when I renew commitment to the Lord, the results are always freedom. Yes. Amen. So when I... How about this scripture? Roll your care over on the Lord. That's right. For He careth for you. Amen. Can you see the freedom that comes from that verse? Because Amen. you're bearing up under all this weight and this yep. tension and this stress and this anxiety mm -hmm. and oh my God, what are we going to do? And oh my God... I can't get them to do right. My family members seems like they've gone crazy. And all of that stuff. And take that care and roll it gahal. Gahal. Roll it over on the Lord. And make it become this day. This is Gilgal. Yeah. The reproach is off me. Amen. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover. And on and on and on the story goes. Um, I remember, some of you probably do too, some of you were here when Dr. Sam Sasser came. Uh, he's He's been here twice to preach through the years. He's in heaven now. But what a great man that was. And... Um, he, t he tells the story of he was a missionary to Micronesia. And he went into, when he got to Micronesia, Micronesia uh, was, it was, it was either 1% or it was 2% Christian. I think it was 1% Christian. I could be wrong about that. But he was so minute it doesn't much matter. And he when he first got there, he was walking the streets and and he went into a bar mm -hmm. and he tried to go in there and witness and talk about and share the gospel, the good news. Well, there was somebody in there didn't want to hear any good news. Mm -hmm. And so that led to the guy in the bar picking Dr. Sasser up and dragging him. This was before he was a doctor, but dragging him out of the bar and beating the daylights out in the street beat me. And I mean just just mutilate me. And so he went back to his camp or somebody took him. I can't remember all the details of the story, but he went back and you know if you went on a missionary trip bar and you went into a an arena or a facility of some sort and they beat the daylights out of it. I mean you know you'd have to You'd have to go process that, right? I mean, you, that's probably an understatement. <laughs> But you just say, what the heck y'all know? Uh, but anyway, so he drags him out in the street, and uh, he, they, and then they put him, they put him up. Uh, he's got a tent and a bed, and and this is at the same time that. Uh, in the United States, we were launching uh, the first astronauts to the moon. Same day. Same day. And so 
he he's had a radio there and he's got tinfoil. Have you ever put tinfoil on the antennas yeah. of your yeah. radio to try to improve yeah. the reception? And so he's got this contraption of their wires and tinfoil so he can listen to the news and he can hear the thing that we're going to make history today. We're going to launch. And he hears these words as he's, he's laying there bleeding, hurting, you know, probably some internal injuries. And he's sitting there and he hears them come on the radio, on the radio, and say, Houston, we are committed. Mm -hmm. And that means they've gone so far in their processes of launching the first mm -hmm. astronauts to the moon that it, we can't stop now. We're right. beyond the point of return. We're, we're going. We're going. Mm -hmm. And the Lord spoke to Dr. Sasser as he was laying there bleeding and said, Sam, are you committed? Are you committed to me and my Micronesia? And he immediately said, yes, I am. Um, and by the time Dr. Sasser was done with his work in Micronesia, it went from 1% Christian, the nation I'm talking about, went from 1% Christian to over 80% Christian. And much of that not all by one man, but it is God that put the dream in the man that brought the gospel to Micronesia. And uh, man, he's like the Pope in Micronesia. I mean, and when he died, uh, his body, I forget what state was he from? It, uh, I forget now what state. Missouri maybe? Well, his body was buried wherever he was from, but he, he had the plan of he wanted his heart taken out of his body and shipped to Micronesia and buried there. That's commitment. That's commitment. Um, and so here's something, as I was thinking on these things in the middle of the night, uh, here's some things that I felt the Holy Spirit say. And I... I make sure I give you this before we go. There is a battle over your commitment. There is a battle over your commitment. There always is a battle over any promised land. And there was for Joshua with the Amalekites and the Amorites and all these dudes. There, there was a battle because God had called him to lead God's people into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Well, there's giants there. Mm -hmm. But why are there giants there? Because it's promised? Mm -hmm. Why are there giants there? Because it's promised. If it wasn't promised, there wouldn't be giants. There are giants right. because it's promised. Mm -hmm. And so God has given us an Adama. God has given us a promised land. A supernatural life while living on the earth. That is a divine plan. A divine promise. And He's given us all those promises uh, that we can live right now, but there's a battle over every one of them. And one of the battles is designed because if the enemy... We'll define that as Satan and Lucifer and all his demons and cohorts, but also your unrelenting soul that won't come under the Lordship of Jesus. That too is your enemy. But the enemy uh, brings a battle to anything that's promised. If you're going to get anything that's promised, there is a fight to fight. Now you got to fight the right way. Because God's way of fighting doesn't look like natural fighting. Because fighting, you know, we know what fighting looks like. But when God goes to war, He goes with some crazy things like pitchers mm -hmm. and trumpets. Mm -hmm. You know, his, his weapons look different yeah. than things that we would, swords and spears, that we would conjure up. And so it, it is a battle, but the reason it's a battle is the land is promised for you. For your family. God has prom given you promises for your family. For this church. For your loved ones. Maybe even for your co-workers. The Lord has filled your heart with promises. Well, there will be a battle. And the battle will start with whether or not we can get 
you yeah. to quit. Mm. Yeah. And you to let go. That's right. And no longer commit. That's you take right. your hands off the plow. It's all yeah. the battle is to get your hands off the plow. That's right. Because your hands on the plow is where you are in danger. That's right. To the enemy. And that's Amen. where you step into somebody else. And could I could I say this? You bring another let me say it this way and I'll clean it up. You bring another Jesus to his table. I do. When you won't quit. Mm -hmm. And when you keep your hands on the plot. Mm -hmm. Now, you know I don't mean another mm -hmm. Jesus. Yes, right. I mean another right. son, mm -hmm. little s, yeah. son of God. Right. But as you grow and as you mature, mm -hmm. uh, it should be that Jesus' life uh, with your life becomes reruns of Jesus. Life. That's right. Amen. Yeah. How many of you go, how many of you like that station? Uh, I don't know what it's called, but. Where you still watch reruns of Andy Griffith. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. oh, yeah. How many times? Yeah. Yeah. Is, there, is there an episode of Andy Griffith you've never seen? <laughs> I think I've seen them all. <laughs> Sometimes uh, along the story, I can't remember what happens right here, but I've seen them. I've seen them. But wouldn't it be something that with your life, somebody saw it? That's Jesus all over again. And it's even more than reruns. It is, it is active, co-laboring together with Him uh, in the earth and bringing His kingdom. Uh, but it takes commitment. Um, the reference there, there is a battle over your commitment because it's a promised land. Just jot this down. We won't turn there. But Joshua uh, 10 um, Verse 6 through 14. Yeah. Actually, 6 through... Did I say 14? Yeah. Yeah, 6 through 14 is the whole story. And there's some mighty good stuff sitting in there. Um, that, But we just probably don't have time uh, to do it today. But... Um, now, let's, let's shift gears here. And so we're talking about commitment. Uh, and the components that make up commitment. And I, I don't know of a better thing to use um, as an example of commitment than, than marriage. Mm -hmm. it, it's a great, um, it's a great, it, well, it's more than a metaphor, it's a manifestation mm -hmm. of, of covenant. Uh, but any time that you shortchange any of these things I'm about to mention, you end up with something less than commitment. Mm -hmm. And now, how many of you know a lot of people get married, but they're not committed? Yes. And it shows up later. Yes. Right? Uh, because, you know, that pretty thing that you married or that handsome-looking thing that you married, well, that changes. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Can I get an right. amen? Yes. <laughs> no, Bishop, it don't change at all. <laughs> yeah, it does change now. Mm -hmm. It does. Uh, but commitment doesn't. That's commitment right. does it, but there is such a battle over commitment, mm -hmm. and it has to do with if the enemy can cause me to let go mm -hmm. and quit, I put myself on the sidelines mm -hmm. of the greatest thing in human history that is happening, of God's kingdom coming on earth. But somebody's got to be committed on earth, right? to, to bring the kingdom to the earth. Amen. Yeah. Amen. All right. Amen. So here, here are some components. And you may break up a marriage uh, into different components. But the first one is there's got to be a vision. A vision. And this is when you dream about a relationship together. Uh, you dream about what kind of home you're going to have with your children. And by the way, those children are going to grow up and love God. True. Come on now. True. Amen. Uh, you you dream about finding and fulfilling your destinies together. Uh, what you're dreaming or having a vision of, though, is not a reality yet, but this envisioning. Say envisioning. Envision. This envisioning prepares me to take the next step mm -hmm. and employ the next component mm -hmm. of this thing called commitment. And then number two... It leads me, all this envisioning leads me to the decision. 
And the decision is, the dream moves and becomes a decision. I willfully and intentionally and permanently decide to give myself uh, to my wife and her to me. So that's more than just dreaming now. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It's now got down to a decision. Mm -hmm. And have you ever known of, of any person who who loves to talk about getting married and the vision part, but when it comes to the decision part, <laughs> well, maybe we'll wait another year. <laughs> well, maybe, you know, it just ain't time yet. We, we just need more income before we can get married. Let me tell you something. This is wisdom I won't charge extra for. You never will be able yeah, to afford marriage. Right. And you yeah. never will be able to afford children. That's right. And please let me yeah. tell you, you never will be able to afford grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 And so you just have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And so, number one component, anyone who's going to be committed, there is an envisioning of commitment is necessary in my heart because I want this precious thing. I want this in my life. But then it comes down to a decision. Mm -hmm. and you, So there's the next step. There's the next stage of being fully committed. The next one is the union itself. Remember we're using marriage as an example. The union itself. Uh, my decision has brought me now to an exciting day where I will exchange vows today. This certain day, today, right now, this is the day that the union is to occur. And so the, in the overlap of vows that happened, your lives were in position to become one. And everything, here's the point that's worthy of writing down, everything that follows from this union taking place, everything that follows would either add or subtract from the union. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. But that is a powerful thing to make a note of. The next thing after the union is it takes discipline. It takes discipline. Uh, so <clears throat> you soon discovered that the quality of your relationship depends on your daily choices. Not on your fancy wedding. That's right. That's right. You can throw, put on the dog of a ceremony. I mean, you can ship your hors d'oeuvres from wherever. And you can have cake made in wherever. And you can have gold plated whatever. And you can have all these pretty dollies and you can have all kinds of pretty stuff and and I mean put it on and and that's part of the union but it's not all of the union. and plenty of marriages have been celebratory and people go into debt for weddings you know that I mean going for it doing all kinds of things but it boils down to your marriage is going to be no better than your daily choices Amen. you make with each other. That's right. And so let's don't let's don't be deceived. Um, so the discipline has got to happen. The wedding ceremony is just the starting point. Now watch this statement: either unconsciously or consciously, you have renewed or edited your vows every day while navigating your life career, child rearing, financial planning, what you've done together as a married couple, it either has edited those vows that you originally made or it has supported them. But your daily choices, commitment is about your daily choices of obedience being made. And remember, the outline that I gave you earlier. My daily choices become my commitment. And my commitment brings my freedom. Amen. Amen. And so, as I am committed, I will have freedom. Uh, and, the, and the longer I live trying to protect myself, uh, I, 
you, you lose that life is what Jesus says yeah. when you do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's the lesson. Your highest priorities stay your highest priorities because you follow that decision that you made with number four, the disciplines that you have. Mm -hmm. Decisions without disciplines are of no value. Mm -hmm. What causes your decisions to have traction and get you somewhere is you follow that up with disciplines. Mm -hmm. I have decided to do this, all right? Then what are the disciplines necessary to cause it to happen? And that's your highest priorities are great, but you got to have some decisions to go with them. Yeah. And your decisions are great, but you got to have some disciplines mm -hmm. to go with them. So without commitment, now watch, a beautiful wedding will not produce a lasting marriage. Mm -hmm. Commitment is what makes a lasting marriage, not the big shindy. Mm -hmm. Right. And likewise, without commitment, a glorious conversion will not produce genuine disciples. Praise How many do you know who got gloriously saved? I mean, it was like Paul on the road to Damascus kind of saved. You know, I mean, it just... All kinds of things have happened to people and they just were gloriously saved and God reached down and just touched them and it looked so much like they couldn't be helped and then all of a sudden overnight... God turns their heart and, and they, they're born again. But that doesn't make them a disciple. Mm -hmm. That's right. And just because you have a glorious wedding doesn't mean you have a glorious marriage. Amen. And just because you have a glorious conversion doesn't mean you're going to have a glorious discipleship. Amen. It takes mm -hmm. discipline. Uh, and it takes a renewing of my commitments daily. Yeah. Now let me close here with this and then we'll have some time together to have a Selah moment. Uh, here's another quote. Persistence is stubbornness with a purpose. Now I don't know how perfectly accurate that is, but you get the point. Uh, persistence is stubbornness on purpose. You have to make commitments and just refuse to let go yes, you of do. those disciplines. Yes, you do. No matter, and so many people, they look up to see how it's going after one day of disciplines. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Has it changed yet? <laughs> and it hadn't changed. And so after many days, you get tired of, of doing the disciplines that you thought went with this decision. Uh, but you renew commitment on your journey uh, with the Lord time and time and time again I've done it thousands of times I guess uh, where I recommit uh, my heart and my, my, my purpose and I, I make sure my purpose is in mind and I, I do number one I get a vision and uh, then I, I move down through that list that I've just enumerated for you uh, here's another one this might be my favorite Commitment is the is making the trip you mapped out. Somebody asked me one time, came up to me and said, "You need to write a book." And I said, "Well, I've started about a hundred. They're in my computer. Not one of them is in print. Why? Because for whatever reason." I never have committed to finish a book. I've got a lot written, and I've got papers and articles and all kinds of stuff written, but I haven't ever finished the book. Why? Because of lack of commitment. And then, oh, well, God just never called me to write. Come on. God called you to freely give everything you freely receive. God wants you to give everything you know about Him away. And print in print is one of those ways. So it's not about your calling. Mm -hmm. It's about your commitment mm -hmm. of finishing and making the trip that you mapped out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to make a plan. Isn't it? Yes. Have you got vacation plans in drawers at home and pamphlets and brochures at home that you never took? <laughs> 
you know, send me you know, something on the commercial or something you find on the internet. Send me more information. Send me more information. I'm all about gathering information. But many people gather information and don't go anywhere. Uh, it, commitment is the taking of the trip that you map out. Two more statements. Uh, commitment takes you down before it lifts you up. And commitment empties you before it fills you. But it surely fills you. And can I say to you that there, there is absolutely nothing that is more fulfilling to me in life than my commitment to the Lord and His commitment to me. That's right. The covenant that we share, the relationship that we share. But that relationship like the marriage, can deteriorate. Yes, it can. If I let go. Yes, yeah. it can. Now, please know He's not going to let go. That's right. You, you yeah. can shake and shake yeah. and shake. You can't shake Him off. That's right. Uh, he, he's not going to quit loving you. No, but you can quit loving Him. Yes, you can. And you can lay down your commitment for yes, the decisions and the results of that will be uh, a limited or a hindered freedom. For Amen. That's right. Freedom comes with full commitment. Mm -hmm. Remember my story about the golf swing. You don't ever decelerate before you hit a golf ball. It never, 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 never will work. You have to always accelerate. Mm -hmm. And we have to accelerate with our commitment uh, in, in the Lord. And we have to renew it. I remember hearing the story one time that the guy, I, I tell this in, uh, in uh, marriage seminars that we did. Um, there, there's a guy uh, driving down the road with his wife and his wife says, Honey, you don't ever tell me you love me anymore. And he said, Well, I told you the day we were married, I love you. If, it'll ch if it changes, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that just ain't romantic. That's not lively. That's mighty cold and dead. Right? No, commitment must be daily renewed. Uh, it, you, the choices that I make now, you know, I was married how many years? 33 years ago. See, I remember. I think it was January the 14th, 1983 of our Lord. <laughs> oh, that was a long time ago. Me and Miss Tammy not living off of what we did 33 years ago. That was a step that caused all this. That was a decision that caused all this. Uh, but what happened 33 years ago just don't have much life today if I don't have daily commitment and make daily choices according to my original decision. That's right. Amen? And I just hear the Lord saying there is a battle over our commitment before the Lord. If we want to fulfill our destinies, if we want to see and become who God has called us to be, uh, thank God for gifting. Thank God for mm -hmm. talent and anointing mm -hmm. and all of those things. But you cannot leave out commitment from the, from the process. Yes. Because uh, freedom comes to those who are committed. That's right. And it can seem like on the front end, you committed and you're doing and you're disciplined. And you're looking up to see if it's changed. And so many times it hasn't changed yet out here. And the temptation is to quit. Mm -hmm. To take your hands off the plow. Mm -hmm. To quit with your commitment. To give up on your commitment. Or edit your commitment. That's right. Can I say that again? Yeah. There's something about that the Holy Spirit wants me to press here. So we got time. We're going to give you free lunch here in 30 minutes or so. <laughs> so. There's something the Lord wants to press right there. Mm -hmm. uh, your commitment. Your commitment to Him. There's a battle of it. Yes, yes. And, and if you'll let go, you won't see 
your destiny fulfilled. You will Mine not either. Do that. Mine either. Yeah. You know, the Lord's the one that does the work. He's the one that you know, he fights the battles. Mm -hmm. He does all of that. But I've got to be committed. You've got to. And I must co-labor together with Him. Mm -hmm. And if I'm just sitting back praying prayers like, Lord, You just do all this thing and, and make me great and fulfill my destiny, and I'm making all the wrong choices and I'm doing all the wrong mm -hmm. things to destroy union rather than build wow. and excite union, right. then uh, I, won't, I won't realize the freedom that someone else who remained committed there's something about commitment that is so powerful. Um, it's not about big talent. That's right. You know, whenever someone who is famous gets born again, it's interesting to me how long it takes them to get on a couch at TBN. I mean days. Maybe the same night they were born again. You know, it doesn't take long right. for us to make celebrities out of our celebrities who will get converted. Right. Yep. Uh, and then you start taking everything they say as, mm -hmm. it's true. as the gospel. Mm -hmm. And they could be as carnal as can be. But then you've got a guy who doesn't have the talent and is not the famous household name. Mm -hmm. But he don't quit. That's right. And month after Amen. month after month after month, he's pressing Amen. towards the mark in his life. He's remaining committed and he's renewing his commitments all along. Amen. The way. That's right. Amen. And that's what I, I hear the Spirit saying for you. For you individually in your own maturity, in you and your ministries that that you're ministering to different ones, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't let up. Uh, now, do seasons come to an end? Well, of course. If the Holy Spirit releases you, then you quit that one. That's right. But you don't quit in general. You don't let go in general. That's right. Amen. And there's a battle for your commitment. And I choose, and you can too, I'm going to win that battle. Yes, sir. I'm going to win that battle. Uh, by God's grace, I'll hold on longer than He does. That's right. Right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, and and you have the ability on the inside of you to hold on like God Yes, holds on. you do. And that's a big hold on to Yes, it is. Yes, it he holds on good. Yes, Amen. Yes. All right, so now let's take a few minutes. We've got 30 minutes before we need to head up there. If you're going up there, uh, we didn't know how many of you would want to, so we just basically said... Let, let's just get ready for all of us to come. Uh, so, if so, that it's it's all bought, and it's paid for, and it's up there, and the drinks will be up there, right? Uh, we need, probably need those to go about ten minutes to one. Are they, are they already up? Already up. Okay. Uh, so now let's let's have a. We got some minutes here. Let's talk about uh, the word of the Lord and commitment. Any any. Any thoughts that you would want to add to or questions that are not clear? What is your meditation that's happening inside of you right now regarding the word about renewing commitment? You, you know, Bishop, just uh, when you made that statement about how the world have a tendency and the church world to just elevate people of, I already have, you know, from I, I the end of, out there in the well-known arena. Right. This scripture in uh, Ecclesiastes came to mind. It says that there was a city that came against, uh, you know, tomorrow. And in that city, there was a poor man there with wisdom. And with his wisdom, he gave them the wherewithal to uh, get delivered. But they did not remember that they're poor man. And see that that that's 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 not. I mean they I once uh, the Lord he people some people have a tendency to like things new and they forget the old. See the word of the Lord you that is always a now word. 
but the word that you heard yesterday is still the word of the Lord. I mean, it just, it just behooves me, and that's in the Bible. One day, I mean, I always used to say that, but one day I was reading it, and it, I found it. It's in the word. The, the, the emphasis that people put on prefaces. Pref I got a preference but no conviction. See, you, you, it'll change, but your convictions? No! I mean, it, it doesn't concern me who's changed. Mine is not changed. Absolutely. No, sir, but preferences come and go. They come and go. You can prefer chocolate, yes, and you kind of leave chocolate alone for a That's while, right. and like strawberry. That's right. Like vanilla. That's right. And <laughs> come back to chocolate later. Yes, you know, sir. That's preference. Yes, sir. I like coffee with cream. Yes, it is. Mm. Yeah. Tammy likes it with cream and with sugar, or not sugar. <laughs> she don't do sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say that again. Miss Tammy doesn't do sugar. <laughs> she, don't do sugar. <laughs> she don't do sugar. <laughs> but that's preference. Yes, it is. Uh, that's not, though. The word, the law. That's right. uh, but there's some things that don't change. It don't and, change. And, uh, no. Commitment is something to relationship change. that doesn't ever it change. Doesn't change. No, you it don't doesn't. have it. You you won't have a good one. Yes, but right. it is a discipline. Yes, it, it is. is a discipline. Yes, it is. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes it is. <laughs> it is a discipline. Yeah. Exactly. It is. Bishop, when you were talking well, about um, describing the commitment to marriage, but I have seen it in the workplace. You know, a lot of people will work just to get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. you know, but when you work with the right heart mm -hmm. and you're committed to it, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it makes a difference with the yes, people that does. you come in contact with. Yes, it does. Day. Right. Yes, it and, is. Uh, it, it's just a, it's it's just amazing how mm -hmm. how you can see people that you work with every day and the difference where you get a paycheck or where you are there mm -hmm. because you're committed to that company and to their mm -hmm. vision and to their purpose. Right. Yeah. To see how people are drawn to the person that is committed. Right, right. Because there <coughs> is a difference. Yes, it is. Yes, it there is. is a difference. Yes, it is. And you know what? The same thing happens in, in corporate church uh, relationships. You have people in the church, many, many of you, fully committed. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, but then you have others who are not so committed. Mm -hmm. It's kind of freeing. They've got their toes, they're dipping in the water. And there's a time for that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But eventually, uh, either you make a commitment or... The wind just blows you. Yeah, that's right. The wind blows you away. That's right. And uh, but people are drawn to those committed members. Mm -hmm. It's my that's point, right. same as your yeah. point. That's right. Uh, and you know those committed members, they think all by themselves. You don't have to tell them everything to do. That's right. Because they, that's right. on the inside, they know the inner core, mm -hmm. the core values of this company are, that's or true. ministry mm -hmm. or church are these things, and so to to promote those things. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have to be told if mm -hmm. we need to cut the grass. Or mm -hmm. we had a leak here the other day. Well, I didn't have to tell Dennis and Karen. They just knew mm -hmm. we got a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and they were Johnny on the spot. That's they helped right. me with... We had a flood, by the way, mm -hmm. this week. I came in on Monday. Y'all left on Sunday and everything was fine. I came in on Monday morning and we got a river going out of the front door. And the water fountain y'all used to drink out of out there in the foyer is not there anymore because <laughs> it burst. I thought it was the restaurant, uh, the one in the bathroom. Uh, it was, it, it, and I thought, well, what happened to the water fountain? You know, when I was coming, I'm like, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it got snatched out on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had two inches deep water in the foyer. Uh, we had to I get the water the out. And we had the, the doctor on it. But you don't have to tell committed people what to do. Uh, when you're committed in your marriage, you don't have to be told everything. Yes, sir. 
That's right. Uh, you just that's what you do. We're yeah. committed. When you got your hands on a plow, yeah. you know, you don't have to be told what you do. That's right. Uh, so commitment is 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 wonderful, and it causes all kinds of wonderful things to happen. But down on the front side, sometimes commitment can take you down before it lifts you up. Mm -hmm. It can cost you before it rewards you. That's right. Baby. That's right. Uh, but it's well worth it. Mm -hmm. It's yes, it very is. well it's worth real. it. All right, anybody else have a <laughs> comment or question? You, you, you know, Bishop, too, uh, just coming back from um, uh, a ministry where my brother was a, a spiritual leader for years, and um, when the people are not committed, you know, they are scattered. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are lead. Mm -hmm. See, and uh, I, he taught me, you know, I, I, and I love, I'm going to share this with you. Uh, you said that you have books, you know, little things. I heard this years ago. If you want to hide something from somebody, Put it in a book. <laughs> That's right. Because they won't. They don't. They won't read. It. They won't read. They, they might buy it, but they won't read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, just coming right from uh, up there, and that was uh, at one time it was a great. It started in a tent ministry, but when uh, seven years ago, when he got struck with the. Um, uh, a stroke they scattered they left because he was no value to them mm -hmm. and they wasn't committed mm -hmm. and that's what I that's what the Lord gives me the capacity to do mm -hmm. when I go up there to be with him to do what he used to do to me mm -hmm. right. share right. and import and see he didn't realize that they was not committed. But he can see it now. Yeah, the same way with that, that second son in the story. You know, he was he wasn't going out squandering living with harlots. But he was in the house. And he was doing his duties. But his heart wasn't with the father. He wasn't committed. It looked like he was, but he wasn't. And when the right circumstance happened, Everybody knew he wasn't committed. And he, out of everybody in the whole story, he's the only one that doesn't get in on the party. Mm -hmm. Pride is a... Bad jealousy. Pride yes, is, is something else. Now. You, you don't want to maintain pride in your heart for long. It costs you dearly. Lord. Sons that were just wee office means mature. So even though they were growing mature, they both still had issues. Yeah. Right. They needed to look and see that they were possibly blinded, that they couldn't see. Exactly. That was hindering them. Right. That was mature past the point. No. You don't have to be aware of that. Absolutely. Pride is not just something that can grip you when you're a little child in the spirit. That's right. It can it can keep you from your full sonship. That's right. But but in the story, it was it was time that they be sons. It was time that they be responsible. That's right. Um, but they didn't. And I, I've I've used for years the uh, the illustration of you know when it when they're going to launch a rocket down at Cape Canaveral uh, as you approach that launch date, the security heightens. And there's guards everywhere. You That's couldn't right. get near that rocket That's if you right. wanted to. Mm -hmm. Why? Because uh, enemies uh, are going to show up yeah. at a time for launch. That's, That's right. what they want to ruin. That's right? what they want to and uh, so it is that we're launching in our lives and our ministries and our careers sometimes. And we do so well until just before the launch. Yeah. And then comes an attack. Then comes a plot and a scheme and an assignment. And we lose out and we don't get launched right at the last minute. When we have built up for so long and been so faithful in our preparation. So you have to know the tactics of the enemy. Whenever you're about to launch something, watch out. 
for his tactics because there's something coming. Because there is a battle for anything that's promised. There's a battle for the people. Well, very good. Uh, let me pray for you and then we will just fellowship around here for a few minutes. And we want to pray for Laurel. Uh, she's, she's leaving us again. So we didn't even welcome her. So would y'all welcome her? <laughs> Now will y'all will y'all pray with me? We send her. So you just welcomed her. Now we're going to send her back away. Uh, she's about to go on another trip. So uh, we we want to. Um, anything you want to say about your trip, Laurel? Um, it's just been the warfare on this one has been very much more intense than any other, and, and I really feel I want to keep feeling about it hearing it because I'm taking a 17 year old and an 18 year old girl with me. So it's reaching generations. I'm opening a generational door. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like when you come get that's what the, the enemy hates. He hates that this is generation. Right. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want another rerun from another generation. No, 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 no. All right. Well, come on up here and uh, we'll. Would you all just stand? There's not enough room for all of you to come up here, but just stand with me and, and uh, let's just release our faith uh, for Laurel and we'll send her. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for powerful truths uh, that fill our hearts and our minds. And one of them is this idea of setting and also the idea of sending. And with our faith, we, we really release it now uh, for this trip uh, in Jesus name and I thank you that every provision uh, is is made Lord I thank you for giving uh, world harvesters the opportunity to uh, sell tickets to support the trip and, and we've done that but Lord we do our spiritual business also and we say, uh, let it be established in, in Laurel's heart and in her mind and in heaven and on the earth uh, that we are committed to her well-being. Yes. And we are committing ourselves to her destined purpose yes. that she would fulfill her destiny. And that 17 and 18 year old, Lord, we are committed to see a breakthrough yes. in their mindset and see something bigger than themselves and see opportunity and see what the kingdom coming on earth looks like yeah. through them yeah. and God plants seeds in them that want fires in them that won't ever go out yeah. and affect the, the people they minister to but affect them as well mm -hmm. and I thank you we pray you. Laurel and the girls all the way there yes. and all the way back yes. before they ever leave and I thank you that no weapon that's formed against them along the way will prosper. And every tongue that would lift its voice up in opposition, we strike down in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you for your very purpose of, of building generationally and all the other reasons for this trip. Uh, it, it's, it's a battle over the trip, but it's a battle because there's certain promises to be realized there. And I thank you that she wins the battles. Yes. Every battle that is to fight, that she would fight it with a good fight of faith. That she would use spiritual weapons rather than natural weapons to win every battle. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Thank you for... Thank you for provision. Thank you. Thank you for security. Thank you. Thank you for protection. Thank you. And thank you for uh, a strong wind. A strong, strong breath of God on every meeting. Whether it's a big corporate meeting or whether it's a coffee over a table. Whatever kind of meeting that there would be the ever-present breath of God behind words and behind uh, testimonies and behind words that are shared. God, uh, conversations that are had. Discussions that there would be a sense of your wind and your breath 
on what is said and done. In Jesus' name. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. Father, we declare over these feet that every place that the soul of these feet shall try to be given to her already. Yes. And we decree and declare, Thank Father, you. that that place is hers to inherit already in the name of Jesus. Yes. I thank you, Lord, for the authority of your name. We declare right now over every place where she walks and every place that she stands. And I thank you, Father, that these hands are lifted up. They're not, they will not hang down, but they're lifted up in strength. Thank you. And her knees are not feeble, but thank they are you. strong thank to stand. Yes. Thank strong you. to stand. Thank, and thank you. you, Father, that you cause her thank face you. to be set like yes. set like yes. flint, Lord, in the face thank of you. adversity. Thank her you. face is set. Her eyes are clear. Thank you. I thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you gird up her loins. Thank you. Gird up her loins. Thank you. Gird up her loins. Thank you. Her emotional Thank you. Is gird up and kept. Yes. Kept by the wisdom. Thank you. The wisdom and the words of your spirit that you speak to her heart. That her her mind is kept. Kept. And therefore her emotions are strong. Are stable, stable, and steady. Yes, yes. Stable and steady. Yes. Because her mind and her thoughts are kept by your word and your promise. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And her emotions will ride. Will ride. Thank you. Will ride. Thank you. In the vehicle. Yes, yes. Of thoughts yes. that are kept yes. by you. And her strength be renewed. Be renewed in Jesus' name. As she goes, that you renew her strength. As she moves forward, you renew her strength. Every day, let Thank her strength you. be renewed. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Father, we pray for all of these that are gathered today. Thank you for the word of commitment. And I pray in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, that you take this word and that you roll, you roll a reproach away in our lives. And that you, we roll the cares that we have on you. We roll them over on to you. And I thank you for the freedom that this brings yes. as we're committed to do your way and your will yes. even down to our daily choices as we choose uh, to do and to obey uh, that we will, that commitment will be formed and our freedom is released. Yes. Yes. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Let it be so. In every life Amen. represented in this room today, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Bless you. Bless you.